what's up? It's Jason Wojo here with the Life Inner Show. And listen, on the Life Inner Show, we help people make more, work less, and create lives and businesses they love. I am joined by Polish PD. What's up, brother? You just called me Polish PD. That's my new name for you. So listen, yeah, uh, okay, whatever. But listen, <laughs> here is what I am a little bit upset about because you guys are going to hear about how he talks about this current guest that we have. He's like a freaking stalker, okay? He <laughs> and I am, I don't know if this is Jay's first stalker ever, but uh, I think Bojo might be the first one. And I'm just kind of feeling jealous because he haven't stalked me, man. So, I mean, what's going on here, man? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, man, you know, I mean, your name is, you don't have a single letter as, as a first name. So, wh- who Peter is referring to is Jay Scott. He's well known in the real estate investing community. Uh, great guy. The, the interview is fantastic. Peter, I mean, he just dropped so yes. many things in here that I, I'm excited for our listeners to, to learn about uh, from running your business to delegating, to systemizing, to how to, to look at your finances. Um, and he makes it, he, he, he breaks, he breaks it down so that I believe, you know, anybody can really learn and do something with this. Yeah. He pretty much dropped a mini business plan yeah. in this episode. He literally started like, okay, you're thinking about doing a business, to actually how to have it run so we don't have to be in it 24 seven. Yeah, yep. And that's a very cool. So let me pull out the notebook, grab a piece of paper and a pen and start taking notes because this is like a mini, yeah. mini business plan. I actually go through this plan with my students when we do full uh, day one-on-one so, yeah, so that's a great, great it's, episode. It's an awesome episode. Get the notes ready, get your hand warmed up because there's a, a ton of nuggets here. Let's jump right into our interview with Jay Scott. Jay Scott, welcome to Life Inner Show, man. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Dude, I was telling you right before we started recording, um, and I don't want to say following, or, but it sounds creepy and, and stalkerish, but like, I've seen you since I started real estate investing, and I started um, a, little, a little later than you, but your name kept popping up. And actually, I, was, I don't know if you know this, I was living in PG County, Maryland. Um, and yeah, I, I was up there. I was actually working for the Navy, um, at Naval Research Lab right there in DC. And I uh, started real estate and your name kept popping up. And, and then um, it's people that you knew. And, and like, I just, I just developed this kind of a, this just like, I don't want to say reverence, but I'm like, this guy is really doing stuff. And he's, and he's just like a rock star and he's like helping people along the way. And, and people really flock to you and you're, you're kind of a teacher and a mentor to a lot of people. And, and you've had uh, an extraordinary journey. And, and I was, and as I was mentioned before earlier, um, what I've seen and what I would really enjoy the most uh, in terms of watching and, and learning from you has been that like a lot of the things that you have posted, like on social media, for instance, I'm like, wow, man, this guy gets it. He's, he, he, he's not just chasing dollars. He's not just going after the next deal. He's, this is part of a bigger plan for him. And, and you've designed your business specifically for your lifestyle and for the things and how, however you determine that you want success to look like. And so before we kind of get into that stuff, tell people a little bit of a background about yourself and kind of like how you got to where you are right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I appreciate those kind words. I actually, I grew up in, in Baltimore County. And, uh, and so I knew of Steve Cook back when, when I started investing back in 2008. And so Life and Air is kind of something that's kind of intersected with, with my starting in the real estate world. So, uh, so it's given back to me a tremendous uh, amount as well. Let's see. Um, I grew up again, Baltimore County. Um, I kind of went the traditional path. I, I went to high school. Then my parents said, you got to go to college. I was actually the first person in my family to go to college. Uh, we grew up, I'd say lower middle class, um, always had everything we needed, but it was never like we had lots of extra stuff. We didn't generally talk about money a lot. We didn't talk about lifestyle or entrepreneurship. My stepfather owned businesses, but it was never talked about. So for me, the natural path was you get out of high school and you either get a job or go to college. My parents both wanted more for me than, than they had. So they said, please go to college. So I went the college route, got an engineering degree, um, got out of college, jumped into the corporate world, uh, did the engineering thing, got my, uh, my MBA. So I 
start doing the, the business thing. And it really never occurred to me that there was another path other than working for somebody else and working a lot of hours and trying to make as much money as possible so that we could have nice things and I could like my family could live better than than I grew up. And so and then 2006 came around and I was in my mid 30s and I'd been doing the single thing forever. And um, and I thought I loved it. And I, I met the woman that I was eventually going to marry. We met at work. Um, she was working like ridiculous hours, 100 hours a week. She was right hand woman to Meg Whitman, the CEO at eBay. So she was like spending her days flying around on the corporate jet and writing speeches and, and all that stuff. And I was working like ridiculous number of hours, traveling a couple uh, weeks a month. And 2007, uh, we decided to get married and it took about five minutes before we realized this lifestyle that we were living, this hundred hour work weeks, traveling two, three, four weeks a month, just wasn't conducive to starting a family, especially in our mid thirties. And so literally it took us about five minutes for us to say, we need to do something different when we get married. We need to, to raise our family differently than the lifestyle to which we've become accustomed. And so Literally five minutes after uh, asking her to marry me and her saying yes, we agreed we were going to quit our jobs before we got married. Uh, so that was at the altar. You guys said, I do, and then we're quit. I do, <laughs> then I don't. Like, yeah, I'm basically. Not worth <laughs> basically, no, we actually decided like six months before we get married, we're going to quit. That gives us six months to kind of figure out what we want to do for the rest of our lives. We, we knew it was something we wanted to put lifestyle above work. Um, we wanted to put our family above making money, um, but obviously we still wanted to, to work and make money and, and, and grow our, our, our net worth. Um, and so we said, but we'll give ourselves six months to figure it out. We'll quit our job six months before we get married. Um, we're, we were moving back to the East Coast. That was like May. We we're getting married in September, August, August. Um, and um, Good to I remember that date. I really should know that. <laughs> <laughs> my, my wife actually agreed to get married on August 8th, 2008, 888, just so I wouldn't forget. And there we go. I still forget. There you go. Nice. <laughs> um, so we, we, we quit our job six months before and we're thinking, okay, now what? Like we quit our jobs. We have no lifeline. We don't know what we're going to do. Um, we've never done anything but work for anybody else. And summer of 2008, we're watching TV and, and uh, HGTV is on and there's a flip show on TV. And my wife said, well, let's flip a house. While we figure out what it is we want to do with our lives, let's do something fun. We're not married yet. We don't have kids yet. We don't have jobs right now. Let's just go flip a house. I thought she was kidding because I'm like the farthest from like a handy guy there is, like barely <laughs> big light bulb. But I said, okay, if my future bride wants to, to flip a house, I'm not saying no. Um, so 2008 summer, we decide to figure out this whole house flipping thing. We flip a house, then we flip a second house and a third and a fifth and a 10th. And before we knew it, like we were house flippers. And before we knew it, real estate had become that vehicle for us to kind of um, continue to make money, but still put our family first. And here we are 12 years later, we're still doing real estate. We do a whole bunch of other business and investing activities, uh, but real estate's kind of was the start of it and has been the focus of it for the last 12 years. Dude, that is amazing. I feel like you're a brother from another mother because I have a similar story where I, I, I went to 15 years of school, dude. I got two bachelors, a, a master's and a PhD and then decided I this sucks. Like I don't, I don't yep. want to have, you know, so man, I can, you're, whew, that's awesome. So tell me, man, I'm just curious about those moments with your wife, then your, your fiance, that's going to be scary for a brand new couple starting off on life together. Like to, to, to just, just, I mean, you guys have clearly have been you were successful. I mean, there was a, a real cost that you recognized and of, of those hours and everything else, but how did you overcome? Was there, was there any fear? Was there any hesitation or were you guys like knew it? Like we can't do this. We have to do it. How did you make that move? Well, here's the one thing or not the one thing, but one of the things I've learned over the years and, and we have talked to hundreds of couples who work together, invest together, want to work together, invest together, have tried to work together, invest together, but it doesn't work. Whatever the situation is, we've talked to hundreds of those couples. And one of the truisms that I've found is that the, the ease at which you can accomplish kind of this, this lifestyle thing is directly proportionate to how much the two people in the relationship are aligned. 
Um, if one person in the relationship is really entrepreneurial and thinking this is like, we can do this and we're willing to take the risk. And worst thing that happens is um, we, we can't figure it out. One of us has to go back to work or worst thing that happens is we lose our, our, our life savings and we have to start over. And the other person agrees, it tends to be really easy. The problems arise when one person's kind of a risk taker, not even a risk taker, but is willing to accept the risks for those rewards. And the other person is very risk averse. Their attitude is, I don't want to lose a penny. I don't want to risk doing something where I have to go back to work. I don't want to risk losing money and having to rebuild. When the two are mismatched, that's where the problems arise. With my wife and myself, we were so fortunate that literally on day one, there was never any question we both went into it with the attitude, if it doesn't work, worst case, we go back to the corporate world. If it doesn't work, worst case, we move into an apartment from our house. If it doesn't work, worst case, we rebuild from scratch. Um, we know that we'll do it together. We know we can do it. Um, and so there was never any of that doubt of what happens if, because we were both aligned with, if, if something bad happens, we deal with it. And so for us, there never was a tremendous amount of fear because we both realized that the worst case scenario, we kind of lived our lives when, when we jump into something new, we think, what is the worst case scenario? How can we mitigate it if it happens? How do we keep it from happening? And what's the, what do we do if it does happen? And as long as you're always aligned on those three things, how to keep it from happening, how to mitigate it if it does happen, and what do you do if you can't mitigate it? Um, if you're aligned on those three things, then it takes the fear away because you realize that you're prepared for that worst case scenario. So I want to jump in here a little bit because I think what you just shared is really important when it comes to fear. You just pretty much shared a strategy, I think, that you guys successfully used to eliminate some of that fear, to dissipate that fear. Because you look at like, what's the worst thing that can happen? Because a lot yeah. of times when people are fearful about taking some kind of an action, they, held the, they have this build up idea in their head yeah. that, oh my God, you know, I'm going to live in a van down by the river. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think it's a great strategy. And here's the thing. If you live in a van down by the river, that sucks. But put your head in that mind space. Think about that. If that's really the worst possible outcome, the absolute worst possible outcome, now compare it to the upside, compare it to the best possible outcome or the most reasonable possible outcome. A lot of times, if you put it into those terms, mm -hmm. you think, ah, it's really unlikely I'm going to end up living down in a van by the river. But what if I do? How horrible is that? Great. I go back to work. I get another job. I, I, I start something that's a lot less risky. Um, I, I go do some consulting. Whatever it is, um, mm -hmm. is probably going to, to make that worst case scenario not seem as bad. And let me tell you something. When the trade-off of, uh, of living in a van down by the river, when the trade-off, the possible upside is living a life that you dreamed about, a lot of us are going to be willing to take that risk of living in a van down by the river. Now, if the worst case no. scenario is somebody's going to die. Somebody's going to be unhealthy. Somebody's going to um, be in a bad situation for the rest of their life. That's horrible. Then maybe you don't do it. But again, no. if the worst case scenario is you have to move into an apartment, the worst case scenario is you have to go back to get a, a job. A lot of times that's really not that bad. People just don't think about it. They just kind of have this amorphous kind of vague notion that really right. bad things can happen. Well, stop. Think about what specifically that really bad thing is and then put those in terms that you understand. Is that really the worst thing in the world? I lived in a, in a tiny apartment for most of my life after college as, as I was growing up. Back when I lived in California and I couldn't afford like more than a one bedroom efficiency. So that really isn't that horrible of a worst case scenario. Dude, I I think that is so powerful because no doubt that in that uh, same exact perspective not only helped you be successful at the beginning when you decided to make that jump from the corporate world into real estate, but every decision thereafter, like for, Hey, should we do this property? Should we expand? Should we buy this building? Should we do this investment? Whatever and that same mentality, like really, I think objectifies what could be subjective. What somebody could, like Peter said, build up in their mind as being this really scary thing that is just all encompassing. No, now, now you're, 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 you're classifying it. You're categorizing it. You're objectifying it to, to make it something concrete and tangible. And then you make a decision based, you know, on objective weights and measures. Um, but dude, 
I love that. That's fantastic. So, and I'll, let me let me also add that age plays a big factor for anybody out there that's young and listening to this. Go take chances. Go put every not put everything on the line, but but go take some risks because time is 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 the biggest corrector of all mistakes. And it's harder. I'm I'm approaching fifty now, and so it's harder for me to take those big risks now than it was a dozen years ago. And it would have been even easier a dozen years before that. So for anybody out there that's young and thinking, okay, well, next year I'll 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 take the big risk, or five years from now, or ten years when I've built up a little bit of a nest egg. Well, let me tell you something. Ten years from now, yeah, you might have a little bit more money in the bank account, but you have lost ten years of of potential risk mitigation. So don't wait. Do it now. Dude, that's huge. That is awesome. So tell me how, so you got, you came from this environment where you guys were both working incredible hours. You go into real estate. How did those early experiences working, you know, for the man influence how you designed your business so that you never returned to that kind of like, you know, cause a lot, here's the thing, a lot of real estate investors, I know they're working crazy hours too. And so they've just basically switched like one boss for another boss, which is themselves. Right. How have you avoided that? So um, I, I'd love to be able to say that I was, my wife and I were geniuses and from day one, like everything worked like clockwork and we were working four hours a week. And it doesn't and, work like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> again, I, I, that's, that's the dream. And, um, but it took us a couple of years and I, I'm not going to share the picture, but I have a picture um, that kind of encompasses what happened those first couple of years. We were about a ye- two years into real estate investing, a year into our marriage and our oldest son was born. And I have a picture of my wife in the hospital, lying in the hospital bed a couple hours after she gave birth. She's got a phone in one ear. She's got two computers on the table in front of her and on the, the hospital bed. And you can see like the top of my son's head as she's breastfeeding him. Basically, literally hours after, um, mm-hmm. after, after she gave birth, she was on the phone doing deals and... I remember looking at that picture and we laughed about it for about 20 seconds. And then after that, it kind of hit us that, wait a second, we traded that life we had where we were making tons of money. We were getting stock options. We had, um, we had control of our hours. I mean, we were working hundred hours a week, um, but it was basically nine to nine every night. Um, we had some job security and we traded that for a, uh, a lifestyle where we were making less money. We had less control. We were working 24 seven and we had less job security and it wasn't a good trade. And that was just a crazy thought to think that, that we gave up those ridiculous hours and now we're working even more hours and we have even less control. So it was about a year, year and a half, two years after we started investing that it kind of hit us that we're doing this completely wrong. And that's when I kind of sat down and I said, okay, how do I do this better? And what I realized was, and, and here, this, this is something that um, may resonate with some people that are listening to this and may actually get people turned off, but I hate real estate. I'm not afraid to admit I hate real estate. What I love is I love building businesses. What I'm good at is building businesses. I'm not good at real estate. I'm not the guy that you want swinging the hammer. I'm not even the guy you want overseeing the people swinging the hammers. Um, I'm the guy you want in the front office, building the team and doing the spreadsheets and building the P&Ls and doing the vision and the strategy and the delegation and really scaling the business. And so it was then that I realized that I wasn't doing that. Um, my wife was on the phone in the hospital room because we hadn't learned to delegate. We hadn't learned to give up control. We were doing everything ourselves. We were finding the properties. We were doing the due diligence. We were rate, We were managing the contractors, finding the contractors, negotiating the contracts, managing the rehabs. We were marketing and listing the houses on the back end. We were going to closings. We were doing everything. And it was then that we, we kind of realized, wait a second, we grew up in the corporate world. I was literally running hundred million dollar businesses for one of the largest companies in the world. She had, she was, was literally flying the private jet for one of the biggest companies in the world. We could do this better. And so it was right then that we stood back and we said, okay, let's figure out how to do this better. Let's figure out how to build this business like a business so that we can extract ourselves from the day to day. And we could really start to focus on the things that were important. And that was building the business that was 
focusing on the strategy and the business and vision. And most importantly, it was focusing on working fewer hours so that we could raise our kids and do the things that we wanted to do when we originally thought about quitting our jobs a couple of years early. And so what were some of those, if you had to look back, and so for somebody who's stuck in that situation right now, you mentioned like, you know, focusing on strategy and delegation and vision, were there some concrete things that you did early on that made a huge difference for you or that were kind of started to move that fulcrum for you? Yeah, absolutely. And so the first thing I did is I, I put myself in the headspace of, okay, we work for big corporations. Bill Gates figured out how to remove himself from the day-to-day. -day. Meg Whitman figured out how to remove herself from the day-to-day. -day. Warren Buffett has figured out how to remove himself from the day-to-day. -day. What are they doing differently than what we're doing? Obviously, they're a lot more successful, but what specifically were they doing and those companies doing that, that we weren't doing? And so when I kind of reframed it in that, that, uh, that way, um, I really started to think about some concrete strategies we could use. First one I thought about was um, you walk into a big company or any company really, and what do you see? you see groups of people working on very specific tasks. If I walked into a Google right now or Facebook or um, a GM, I'm going to see the marketing team. I'm going to see the QA team. I'm going to see the operations team. I'm going to see the finance team. I'm going to see the documentation team. I'm going to see all these different teams. And the person that's writing the code for the software isn't the guy that's, that's doing the, uh, the accounting. And the person that is doing sales isn't writing software. Everybody has a very specific role. So the first thing I realized was I needed to segment my business correctly. We needed to figure out what were the core roles in the business. And then we needed to find the people to focus on those roles so that we could actually start to, to focus. And so I sat down and, and kind of the exercise that somebody had recommended to me at the time, and it was brilliant, was take all my to-do list items. And I'm a big to-do list guy. Um, and I had literally thousands of to-do lists, each with hundreds of to-do list items, because I love checking things off. It's the greatest feeling in the world. And they said, <laughs> take one of your to-do list items, put one item on a sticky note and put every item on a different sticky note. Walk those sticky notes up to, to the nearest wall and start putting them on the wall and start organizing them. Like this sticky note goes with that one. This one goes with that one. Just don't even think about it. Just kind of organize them in ways that make sense. And after doing that little exercise, what I realized is that every single task in my business fell into one of four categories. It was either related to acquisition. It was related. And I had a flipping business. Keep in mind, it could be completely different for other businesses. But for my business, it was either acquisition. It was renovation. It was disbursement or selling of the property. Or it was fundraising. Every single task I did, literally thousands of tasks over years, every single task fit into one of those categories, acquisition, rehab, disbursement, or fundraising. So I said, basically, those are the four core parts of my business. And so from that day, I said, okay, we're going to have an acquisition team. We're going to have a rehab team. We're going to have a disbursement team, and we're going to have a fundraising team. Now, it, at this point, it was still my wife and myself. So these were our teams but at least it gave us a framework to think about it. And I told my wife, I said, look, you're really good at the acquisition side and the disbursement side. You're really good at talking to people, getting deals, marketing, selling deals. I want you to kind of manage those two pieces of the business. I'm really good at the spreadsheets, the managing contractors, doing the scope of work. I was the fundraising guy. I was the one talking to investors and banks. So I'm going to take these two. So at that point, we now had the structure of our business and we had delegated control of that, those pieces of the business between my wife and myself. So that was the first piece. And what I realized was, even though it didn't make a big difference, it was still two of us and our business hadn't changed, just getting our head around, these are the four components of the business and this is who's in charge of it. Because honestly, the biggest issue my wife and I had for the first few years, type A personalities, and we both think we know everything. So <laughs> every decision ended up being a struggle. Like, how much do we want to list this property for? Well, she said 130000 I thought it was 125000 We'd argue about it for 20 minutes. But once we realized that, no, she's in charge of, of acquisition and disbursement, that's her decision. Maybe she comes and consults me, consults with me and asks my opinion. But at the end of the day, that's her part of the business. So she makes those decisions. I make the decisions on the rehab and the contracting because that's part of my business. She can have a say, but at the end of the day, that's my decision. And so once we recognized that we had these segments of the business and we delegated control to either her or me, that solved literally 75% of the problems. The rest of the problems we solved by doing a couple other things. Next, we started delegating. 
we started to ask, okay, so my wife doesn't have time to do all the acquisitions and to do all of the disbursements. I mean, there's a lot of work there, finding deals and negotiating deals and contracts and going to closings and doing due diligence and staging and marketing and listing and negotiating on the back end and closing on the back end. That's a lot of time. So she basically said, how can I take each of those two pieces of the business that I control and optimize them? And I did the same thing. I said, how do I take each of the two pieces of the business I control and I optimize those? And we did this in a couple of ways. One, we delegated. We hired or brought in the right people. Now, when people hear that, they think, oh, no, I'm, I'm not ready to start hiring people. Well, hiring people is a great, great, great way to like take things off your plate, delegate and really start to scale. But you don't have to hire a full time person. If that terrifies you. Start small. Bring in a contractor, a 1099 employee that you can just hand a check to to work 10 or 20 hours a week. Bring in a partner, somebody else that does that in the business and say, hey, I'm going to give you 10% of every deal to do this for me. Bring in a part-time employee. Bring in somebody to work 10 or 20 hours a week. Um, share an employee with another investor. Go find another investor and say, hey, I need a transaction coordinator. You have a transaction coordinator. You may only be using your transaction coordinator 20 hours a week. Can I use her the other 20 hours a week? And then eventually get to the point where you say, okay, now I'm ready to hire a full-time employee. There's lots of options for delegation. Next, documentation. Documentation was like the biggest game changer in our business. What we realized is we were bringing in people who were doing the job. They get really good at the job. And then six months later, they'd find a better job where they realized, ah, I know enough that I can compete with these guys now. So I don't need this anymore. And they'd leave. Then we'd start over. We'd bring somebody in. I'd bring in a project manager and I'd have to spend three months training the project manager again or training the acquisitions guy again. And that just wasn't scalable. So at some point we realized we need to start documenting each of these positions. We need to create systems and processes and we had to put them down on paper. And for us, that was literally the biggest game changer because then we could bring in anybody at any time and we could say, this is how we do our transaction coordination. This is how we do our interviewing of contractors. This is how we create a scope of work. Here's the documentation. You don't need me to train you. I can go and do what I do best, read the documentation, ask questions, go ask other people on the team that, that have been doing this. And then people could basically train themselves. So those three things, segmentation of the business, delegation of as much as we could, and then documentation of everything we were doing really got us 90% of the way towards allowing my wife and myself to extract ourselves from the day-to-day -day of the business and really focus on the trajectory and the, and the strategy and the vision for the business. Dude, that is gold. Like that, like I hope mm -hmm. everyone listening, like really was taking some crazy notes. You're gonna have to listen to this again because there's so many nuggets of, of awesome wisdom that you've been, you know, that were experienced by you and, and tested in the real world, not just some armchair expert saying you should do this stuff. You guys did it and saw the results and the fruits as a result of that. That's awesome, man. Um, and I, I, let me just point out because anybody that's listening to this again, I need to reiterate, it took us years to do that. So anybody that's sitting there thinking, oh, Jay worked in the corporate world and he has an MBA and yeah, I do. But it's not something that comes naturally to anybody. So right. don't think it's not achievable. It takes hard work. It takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. Expect it's going to take six months or 12 months or 24 months. Every day, make a little bit of progress and you'd be surprised how quickly things start to snowball and compound. And in a year or two, it, it, you don't have to, I'm not a genius. Trust me, I'm the furthest thing. Anybody can do it. Just expect that it's going to take time and expect that the little things will eventually start to compound. I'm glad, listen, I'm glad that you said that because one of the things that are popping up to my head as you were talking, and I think some of the people in the audience were like, well, it's easy for you to say because your wife worked for a huge eBay company. She was like the right-hand person, you know, you're managing multi-million dollar, you know, in the corporate contracts, whatever, but I'm just a regular Joe. And the stuff that you shared and the process that you shared has really nothing to do with the corporate world, really. It just has to do with you being diligent, persistent, right? And taking those small steps <clears throat> to get to the end result. Absolutely. It's basically you start by carving out one hour of your day to focus on your business, not in your business. I know that's cliche. That's right there. 
but, but, but that's really important. One hour a day where you say, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to think about all those tasks that I do every day that aren't worth my time. And we can talk about that. That's actually an important consideration as well and figure out how to get them off my plate. Um, let, let, yeah, let me talk about that for a second because this is a huge concept and this was a, a major game changer for me. Um, one day somebody said to me, I was doing something. Um, it's okay. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to throw myself under the bus. Here. I, I was doing my own accounting. Um, I, I love to do accounting. I was doing my own accounting and somebody said like, I can't believe you still do your own accounting. Like you're doing like 40 properties a year. Um, like, why are you doing your own accounting? And I'm like, ah, I just don't trust anybody else. Um, I don't want to pay somebody to do the accounting. And they're like, why did you get into real estate? And I was like, the freedom for the time freedom. Um, and they're like, okay, is it just the time freedom? Cause if it's just time freedom, you can quit your job altogether. Just don't have a job. Well, I was like, well, I need the money too. And they're like, okay, so you got into this business for the time and the money. Um, talk to me about the money piece. How much money did, do, do you want to make from your real estate business? And I was like, I don't know. I never thought about it. I want to make a lot of money. Well, they're like, well, think about it. Did you get into this business to make $20 an hour or $50 an hour or a hundred bucks an hour or 500 bucks an hour? Um, and I thought about it. I was like, well, I want to make a thousand dollars an hour, which is like 2 million bucks a year full time. And I didn't really think about it. I just kind of threw it out. A thousand bucks an hour sounds great to me. They're like, okay, you can make a thousand bucks an hour. How do you make a thousand bucks an hour? I don't know. How do I make a thousand bucks an hour? And he said, you make a thousand bucks an hour by only doing tasks that are generating you a thousand bucks an hour. If every single task you do in your business is generating a thousand dollars an hour, at the end of the year, you're going to make a thousand dollars an hour. You know how you don't make a thousand dollars an hour by focusing on tasks that don't make a thousand dollars an hour. Now, how much could you hire an accountant for? I was like, I don't know, 20, 25 bucks an hour. Okay. Every time you do your own accounting, you're basically doing a $25 an hour job. And by doing a $25 an hour job, you're generating $25 an hour. Are you happy making $25 an hour? I'm like, no, I'm not happy making $25 an hour. <laughs> then stop doing the $25 an hour job. Stop doing the $50 an hour job. Stop doing the $100 an hour jobs. Do the $500 and $1,000 an hour jobs because at the end of the year, if those are the jobs you're doing, that's the amount of money you're going to be making and delegate everything else. And so when I really thought about it in those terms, it made me realize I shouldn't be doing the accounting. I shouldn't be painting my own houses. I shouldn't be doing due diligence and interviewing contractors because all of that stuff, I can delegate for a whole lot less than $1,000 an hour. And I should be focusing on the pieces of my business that literally generate $1,000 an hour. And when I thought about it, there aren't too many pieces of my business that could generate $1,000 an hour, but there were a few. Number one, acquisitions. So generating a pipeline of deals, because if I don't have deals, I'm making zero in my, in my business. But if I can generate deals, I'm going to make a lot of money. Number two, raising money for those deals. I can have a hundred amazing deals, but if I can't take them down because I don't have the cash, then those deals are worth zero to me. So the first thing I realized was if I can spend 20 hours finding a deal, 20 hours raising money for a deal, that's 40 hours I put into that deal. If I can delegate everything else and then make $40,000 on the profit of that flip, I just made $1,000 an hour. Mm -hmm. I put in 40 hours, I made $40,000, I delegated everything else. That's $1,000 an hour. I can literally make $1,000 an hour if all I do is focus on acquisitions and raising money and then delegate everything else. And it's very reasonable that I can delegate everything else and still make $40,000 on a flip for the flips I was doing. If I can scale that, maybe I can get my acquisition pipeline down so I only have to spend 10 hours finding a deal. And I only have to spend 10 hours raising the money because I get my fundraising pipeline really efficient. Well, now I'm spending 20 hours on a deal, but I'm still making $40,000 on a deal. I'm now making $2,000 an hour. So it's very possible to be making $500, $1,000 an hour in this business, but it requires me to think about what are those tasks in the business that are generating that amount of money, and then force myself to focus on those tasks, delegate everything else. Now, maybe you don't want to make $1,000 an hour. Maybe you're happy making 100 k a year. That's 50 bucks an hour. Great. Focus on those things in your business that generate 50 bucks an hour. You want to do your own plumbing? If you're going to spend 100 bucks an hour on a plumber, great. If you're happy making 100 bucks an hour, do your own plumbing. But if you want to make 50 or 100 bucks an hour, don't do your own painting because you can find a painter for 25 bucks an hour.
So start to think about things in terms of what is my time worth? How much do I want to make an hour working and building this business? And then what are those tasks that will and won't allow me to accomplish that hourly rate? And anything that doesn't allow you to accomplish that hourly rate, hire somebody, delegate and focus on something else. Man, that is super powerful because I think a lot of people look at it as like, hey, uh, you know, they, they have a rental property and they're like, oh, I don't want to pay somebody 25 bucks to go change a, a toilet flap or I'll go do it myself. Meanwhile, it just took you, you know, an hour and a half to drive there to do it, to come home. And you ended up really losing money for your business. Uh, you're not, you're, 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 it's, it's the exact opposite is what you need to look at. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm, if for my rental properties, I have property management and I pay between eight and 12% a month on the gross revenue for that rental property. So rental property that's, that's, uh, that's netting or that's grossing five, 1500 a month. I'm paying 10% of that or $150 a month to a property manager, $150 a month. Well, let's say I want to make $500 an hour in, in my business overall. If I'm paying 150 bucks a month for that management of that rental property, if I were going to spend even a third of an hour a month, 20 minutes a month on that property, and 20 minutes is really easy to spend on a rental property. You have to do a turnover, maintenance issues, getting new tenants in, taking calls in the middle of the night, managing contractors, whatever it is, it's easy to spend 20 minutes a month on a rental property. It is more financially beneficial for me to hire that out if I'm going to spend even 20 minutes a month on a rental property. And I'll spend 20 minutes a month on average on every rental property. So I hire everyone out and I never think about it again. Dude, that's awesome. That's super cool. So I, man, I got to tell you, I love the way you think about business. And I think it's such, it's such a process driven, systematic kind of approach that you've really, you've really maximized a lot of the kind of factors involved in being, being successful. One of the things we haven't talked about yet has been kind of how you've, how you look at finances in your business. And, and I'll tell you one of your recent posts on Facebook grabbed my attention. You were talking about debt. Um, and tell, tell me a little bit about how you, you steward the, the financial side of your business and, and so maybe some things that make you a little bit different than most people. Sure. Um, well, let me start with, um, I'm one of those people that, um, believes that there's no optimal financial decisions. Sure, if you just look at the math, you can always say that one decision is better than another. But when it comes to your life and your business, it's never just math. And I, I think the, the Facebook post that you might have been alluding to uh, was a post about, I bought a car recently, and I was able to get a 2% interest rate on the loan for the car. Um, bank was willing to, to lend me money over seven years at 2% interest. And so normally my first calculation, if somebody were to ask me, hey, should I get the loan on the car? It's a depreciating asset. So loans are typically considered not a good thing, but a 2% loan on, on a car, should I take that loan or not? If somebody were to ask me that question, first thing I would say to them is, well, let's say you could get $50,000 in loan against the car. Not that most people should be buying a car that expensive, but let's pretend you can get $50,000 in loan against a car um, at 2%. Well, the first question is, what are you going to use that $50,000 for? If you're going to stick it in a savings account, it's probably a bad idea because you're paying 2% and you're getting a tenth of a percent in a savings account. But let's say you're going to take that money and you're going to stick it in a real estate investment or you're going to stick it in, uh, in a, a safe um, stock market investment. You may generate 4, 6, 8, 10% returns. Well, if you're getting money at 2% and that money is earning you 6, 8, 10%, well, you're making more than it's costing you in, in interest. So from a purely mathematical perspective, the arbitrage is allowing you to make money. Borrow money cheap, generate more on it, and you're making money. So from a purely mathematical standpoint, the right answer is if you can borrow money really cheap and you can do something with it to make more than whatever your borrowing costs are, you should borrow as much as possible. That's the mathematical answer to the question. But in real life, it's more than just math. What I realized was I, I took the loan on this car. And the first time the payment was due, I got the statement in the mail, the monthly statement. And I looked at it and I realized, eh, I made more on what I did with the money in, 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 in investing profits than what I'm paying on this note. But it still makes me uncomfortable. It was a reminder that I have a car that I don't own. I have a car that somebody else's own. I have this depreciating asset that somebody else technically owns and I'm just making payments on it. And that made me uncomfortable. The math was easy. It was the right financial decision mathematically, 
But personally, it was the wrong decision for me. I didn't sleep as well at night. Every time, the first time I got the, the, the statement, it made me uncomfortable. The second time I got the, 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 the statement, the monthly statement, it made me really uncomfortable. The third time I got the monthly statement, I thought to myself, you know, screw the math, screw the finance piece. As much as this might be the right math decision, I'm losing sleep over having a car note. It's crazy as it sounds. I was literally losing sleep because I felt like I owned, I had this debt that I didn't want to have and I couldn't really quantify it. And so I said, you know what? I'm paying off the loan. I'm paying off the car loan. And so it's just a small example. But the point there is that every time you make a financial decision, you have to analyze it from two perspectives, not just the math perspective, but also analyze it from the comfort perspective. People always ask me, so I can get, a, I, I can buy a house and I can renovate it and I can go refinance and pull hundred percent of the money out. Um, is that a good thing to do? Well, Financially, yeah. If you can pull out 100% of that money at, at a 3% interest rate, and then you can take that money and put it into something else that's generating 8, 9, 10%, that's a brilliant thing to do. Do it a thousand times. But then when you look at it as the, well, what happens if the market crashes? What happens if the loan gets called due? What if I'm over leveraged? Well, that can really, for a lot of us, that makes us not sleep well at night. So don't just look at things from the mathematical point of view, look at things from a comfort point of view. And what I've really realized over the last several years is that I have a very specific comfort level for my debt. I don't like to be more than 65% leveraged. I want to know that everything I own can drop by 50% or one third, um, depending on how you look at the math, everything I own can drop by one third of its value and I'm still not underwater. So for me, it's, it's just some arbitrary number, but when I look at my, 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 debt to value, my LTV across my entire portfolio, if that number is under 65%, I sleep well at night. If it's over 65%, I don't sleep well at night. A lot of people would tell me I'm an idiot for being so low. 65%, you could get more leverage. You can make more money on the, on the leverage. You can invest the, 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 the proceeds from refinancing. I don't care because for me, it's not just a mathematical equation. So what I tell everybody is look at things from two perspectives, not just the math, but also from the personal comfort level. And don't ever go against your personal comfort level because sleep is more important than math. But I think that's the reason why you still have hair and why you still look like in your 30s when you're approaching 50. Yeah, it's a little bit gray, but uh, yeah. But well, it's a great point though. Yeah, well, the thing is, I think, you know, most people, like you said, Jay, like look at the math and they're like, oh, you know, there's, there's a lot of... Uh, proponents out there of like maxing out your leverage because it means more assets and it means a bigger portfolio, more, more deals, whatever that looks like. But they ignore the other side of that, which is like, there's a very real, I think, um, mental cost to that debt. Um, whether it, and, and that shows up in every part of our life, the more stressed we are, the more sleep we lose, the more, uh, we're anxious or worried about, about that. It, it, it affects everything, you know, in life, you know, we talk a lot about, um, and we encourage people to even consider a, a debt-free investing business or debt-free lifestyle because, you know, debt basically means you promised away future time to, to service that debt. And so is that something you really want to do? And, and we're not saying it's, it's, it's wrong or right. We're just saying, make sure you know what you're getting into. And you're saying the same thing, like, make sure you're not just looking at the numbers, you're looking at the other side of it as well. Yeah, and, and I'm, my wife and I wrote a book on negotiating, and one of the key points in the book is um, you're never in a good position when the other party has leverage over you. You always want to have more leverage over the other party. You always want to be in a position where you can walk away without any consequences. But whoever wants the deal more is likely going to win in a negotiation. And when you are stressed in your business, it's like negotiating against yourself. Every time you need to make a decision, when the leverage against you is additional stress, you're going to make a suboptimal decision. And if I know that um, every time I make a decision, I run the risk of financial ruin, I'm not going to make an optimal decision. I'm being leveraged against this invisible opponent, the stress is leveraging me and forcing me to make decisions that I don't necessarily want to make. When I can make a decision free of any stress, when I know that whatever the outcome of the decision is, it's not going to materially affect my life, it's a lot easier to make the right decisions. 
I don't have that 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 risk of um, the other side of me. The the I need to pay a bill next month, um, or I need to pay off my bookie. For some people, um, when you have that hanging over your head, um, basically you now you, that stress part of you cares more than the rational part of you, and the stress part of you is going to win. You're going to make the decision that that feeds that stress or or alleviates that stress more than you're going to make the decision that 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 feeds the rational part of your brain. I don't know if I explain that yeah, right. Yeah, no, 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 no. I I totally get that. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that you you explained that quite well. Yeah. So and this goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, which is know what your your worst case scenario is. For me, um, if uh, I know the worst case scenario, if I'm 100% leveraged, I don't like that. I also know the worst case scenario if I'm 65% leveraged. That doesn't bother me. So I'm I'm basically making the decision where I can look at the worst case scenario and say, eh, if that happens, I'll make it through. Right. Right. Yeah. Big difference. Big difference. Well, listen, Jay. I this has been amazing. Um, I want to really thank you for coming on the show. I know our, our viewers and our listeners got an incredible amount out of this. How do they learn more about you? Because you're also an educator. You help a lot of people as well. Like where do they find more about you? Yeah. Um, so if anybody wants to connect with me or find out more about me or, or link up with me anywhere, uh, go to www.connectwithjscott.com. Um, and that has links out to, to everything, my websites, my social media, and my email. Awesome. Thanks again, man. This has been incredible. Can't wait to do, we'll have to do another one here too. Awesome. I appreciate it. Thanks guys. Thanks. Man, that was amazing. That I gotta tell you, man, this was probably one of my favorite interviews we've done so far because uh, so much of what he said just resonated with me. I'm like, yes, yes, yes. Like from, from the story, from working those crazy, crazy hours to realizing there had to be more to life to, to going through that business journey of setting up business and then realizing, ah, we got a course correct here. Uh, this isn't what we wanted. And, and taking the steps and, and, and I just, I just love that the, the whole interview is so much value there. Yeah. There's a lot of really good nuggets. And one thing I just heard, like my takeaways is Hopefully like people who know that I've talked to them, like my students or people that on social media have heard me, they know that I'm not crazy. There's other people who are pretty much saying the same thing. What he laid out here is really important steps on how to grow the business the right way. You know, and if you think about it, you know, one of the things that he did is go and methodically take the small steps to get to where you want to go. A lot of people think they need to take this huge leap, right? to make a big transition in the business. And all he's been laying out is just taking those daily steps. You know, he says, take, what do you say? One hour or 20 minutes or yeah. something yeah. to work like on your business. Yeah. Every day, work on your business. Well, That's even it. if it's, but even if you can't do that, start with an hour a week, right? Yeah. And, and what, but what I loved about his approach, and this is probably his engineering mind, is like you said, he broke it down systematically, methodically to small steps. And so like the very first thing he did, you know, if you're looking at me right now, he has his post-it notes, right? And he, he mm-hmm. took a post-it note and wrote down a single task and started categorizing them. And so, you know, one sm- and, and the other thing I, I heard from him is he's very observant. Um, and so he, he realized that many of the tasks, for instance, on these sticky notes fit into different categories. And then he, then he realized probably where his time was going. And then, and then he kind of started to, he's just observant to the feedback that, he, that he's getting or the results that he's getting. And so he takes those results and then kind of feeds them back into like, is this what I want? And if not, what right. do I do next? And that's kind of a, he did, he talked about that a little bit with the, the worst case scenario, right? He, he mm-hmm. kind of analyzed and broke out and dissected the worst case scenario, best case scenario, most realistic scenario, most, um, most probable scenario. Um, and so I think that approach serves a lot of people very well in business. And what you said as well is it doesn't have to happen overnight. You can't, don't look at a guy like, like Jay and think that you're going to create his business overnight. This took him years to do and Mm -hmm. don't be hard on yourself. Don't beat yourself up and try to, and and don't stress yourself out trying to create this business and work a hundred hours a week, trying to create a 20 hour week business. Right. Cause now that's not the way to do it either. Right. And that, you know, one thing that I really like is, the whole thing about, we talked about the fear at the beginning. He literally analyzed the fear and broke it down, worst case scenario. And at the end of the day, he's looking as well, it's not that bad. And that's a great way of literally dissecting different parts of your business, different parts of your life, because this doesn't just apply to business. You can apply it to life. One of my students has a whole bunch of kids. 
they're kind of figure out how to run that in a way as a business, you know, because otherwise if you have like six kids, man, that household is going to be crazy if you don't put certain things in place. So you can use that analogy and not only in business, but in life and, you know, and uh, it works really, really well, I think. Yeah, no, dude, awesome episode, tons of nuggets that were dropped here. Um, uh, yeah, it's it fantastic. I, I'm very appreciative of him sharing with, with all of us. And so I hope you enjoyed this episode as well. If this is something that you uh, want to give two or four, eight thumbs up, I don't know if that's possible, but you can leave us a review and give us five sure. stars. That'll work. And, and uh, listen, if you want to learn more about what Jay is doing, go check out this, the site he link, linked uh, in the show notes. And we will also... Um, of course, as always, continue the conversation always in the, uh, over in the Life Inner app. Just download it for your iPhone or your Android device or use desktop version as well. As always, it is an incredible pleasure. And so until next time, like start looking at the vision for your life, for your business, what you want to achieve, what you, how you want to do that through uh, what you do. Look where you're spending your time and start to systemize and move towards that direction. It doesn't happen overnight, but I promise uh, it's worth it. Like Jay said, it's, 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 the dream is worth it. Um, and I, I, and everybody here can achieve that. So very grateful. Catch you next time.